very pleased that Senator John Lamping could join us today for a brief discussion of the special session. We were anticipating it would be a wrap-up, but actually it's more like a progress report. <laughs> we thought that you would appreciate a brief overview from Senator Lamping about where they are and what he sees um, or when it's going to end. Um, an equally brief discussion from one of our policy analysts concerning our role in a very visible piece of legislation, Aerotropolis, with a short discussion of issues to consider in the future, particularly with respect to tax legislation. Um, we're going to open the floor for Q&A, and we hope we have a vigorous and informative dialogue. Now, I'd like to introduce our two speakers. Senator John Lampy is a native St. Louisan. He's a graduate from St. Louis University High School. I was told I had to say that. Not by Senator Lamping, but one of our staff. And he earned his degree in economics from a little-known university called Princeton. He later obtained an MBA in finance from New York University. Senator Lamping and his wife Karen have six children. And of course, they live in the 24th Senatorial District. He's the branch manager for a major St. Louis-based securities firm and he's active in many community and charitable endeavors. He serves on several Senate committees that would take me a few minutes to list, but he is Vice Chair of Commerce, Consumer Protection, Energy, and the Environment, and we are very pleased that he could join us today. Our second speaker will be Audrey Spaulding. She's our lead policy analyst concerning state tax credits. She graduated from the University of Missouri with dual degrees in economics and journalism. Earlier this year, she was responsible for shining a light on the operations of the Land Reutilization Authority, which is a land bank in St. Louis City that was created in the 70s. Back then, it held about 2,000 parcels of property. It now holds over 9,000 parcels of property. We are confident that by Audrey shining a light on their processes, they've begun the, the hard work of changing how they operate. We are going to continue to ensure that those changes happen, are real and permanent. She and one of our other policy analysts, Christine Harvin, who's no longer with us, she has joined ALEC, um, first uh, focused our attention on Aerotropolis, but she and Patrick Ishmael have been working tirelessly on researching this particular tax credit program and sharing their findings with our public officials and with the public. Now, it is with great pleasure that I turn over the lectern to Senator Lampy, and I will step out of the way. Well, thank you, uh, Brenda, for that uh, kind introduction, and, and uh, thank you all here uh, for coming here this morning. Um, this is the inaugural event. I didn't realize it, and, and hopefully you enjoy yourselves this morning, and hopefully you invite me back soon. Uh, I came to know about the Shelby Institute maybe two or three years ago. I was introduced through a friend. Um, and I'm one of those that is always trying to seek out information about things. And, and as you know, and you fill a big gap in, in, the, um, in the discourse, there's not a lot of uh, research, the type of research that you do on things specific to state and local uh, policy. So I really appreciate all the things that the Show Me Institute does. Uh, what Brenda asked me to do, and uh, for Audrey and I both to do, is really to speak very briefly and then open it right up to Q&A because um, there's all kinds of questions I'm sure you have, and there's, it's interesting, this is my first time ever in elected office in my first year in the Senate, obviously, and it's extraordinary the public misperception of what actually goes on down there and where things are. But I, I will speak very briefly to the special session. Um, we are officially in technical session, and what that means, and that began maybe two weeks ago, we were only in session, the Senate was only in session about six days. Um, we were called a special session, but the idea being that some compromise had been worked out between the House and the Senate, specific to, um, I, I call it a tax reform bill. Some call it Aerotropolis bill. Um, uh, there's all kinds of different perspectives. The, uh, in all honesty, we should not have been called back to special session. There was a very wide gap between the House and the Senate. Uh, the, the reform, asked, uh, the, 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 those that are for um, tax credit reform, um, exist almost exclusively in the Senate. That's where the strongest reform positions are. Um, and uh, the Senate bill that was passed back in April put very uh, strict, uh, well, really, really would serve to, to curb and ultimately eliminate a lot of our tax credit programs. That was the compromise. That was the only way the Senate was going to agree to take up the China hub part of the legislation. Um, we were very, very far apart uh, between uh, at the end of, end of the regular session. And I was mentioning some of your members earlier, the only decision to go forward was that was the China Hub proponents just didn't want to stop. They wanted to keep going forward. They didn't want to hear no. 
here in the St. Louis area, all of our local business groups, RCGA, Civic Progress, RBC, are all uh, publicly very much for this idea. And so that idea had a hard time dying. Um, we, uh, we met as a Senate caucus uh, after it was announced by leadership that a compromise had been met. And that compromise was negotiated by a very small number of state senators. When that idea was introduced to the caucus, it, there was no compromise. So the caucus you know, didn't agree with what this idea was in terms of uh, compromise legislation. When we were called into session, uh, we actually went to work. We took up um, what is Senate Bill 8, which is a version of this tax credit reform bill. And you can see that bill itself changed dramatically from what the Senate had passed back in April. And what that suggests to you is that there was no um, kind of understanding or compromise. And, and we passed that bill and we, we, we left the Capitol. We went to technical session. Now what that means is, is that if the House decides to take up that bill and pass it, then it will go to the governor's desk. <coughs> and um, every indication from the House has been that um, they don't want to pass anything, that, that they, they don't want to negotiate in public. They want to pass something that we would agree to before they passed it. And we just won't do that. And so what was announced this week was, uh, which was in the press today, is that, or this week, is that the House is going to go down tomorrow uh, and they're going to hear in committee their version of a House bill and then they're going to pass their version of a House bill. What we, we know what their version is going to look like and the Senate's not going to take it up. So, so, I mean, I've been telling people for the last two weeks, I mean, I've been telling them for two months that nothing's going to happen, but for the last two weeks that unless Senate Bill 8 is passed, um, session is over. So. Well, thank you for that update. <laughs> uh, we'll see if it continues to live on and on. It seems like that is the case. Um, I just want to talk about what the Show Me Institute did in regards to the Aerotropolis bill and kind of give you all a sense of where we're, we're going. We really strive to serve as an informational resource for both legislators and the general public. This all started in the spring when someone familiar with our work at the Show Me Institute on tax credits contacted me and said, have you read the Aristopolis legislation? And I said, no, I haven't, but I'll take a look. And after reading it, I spoke to a number of my colleagues here and said, you know, I think we really need to do something on this. And this was because at the time, it was worth $480 million in subsidies. That's half, almost half a billion dollars. <coughs> and primarily, the subsidies would have gone to warehouse and facility, and facility construction, about $420 million. And what, what we wanted to do, and what we worked to do, is say, okay, we're talking about hundreds of millions of dollars here. What are you know, the, uh, the promises being made? The promise of increased international trade. All sounds well and good, but can we compare proponents' claims against facts? So for example, a uh, proponent said that there is a shortage of warehouse space in St. Louis. And uh, one study commissioned by the RCGA assumed that $300 million would be put entirely towards warehouse construction. Basic market research says that there's more than 18 million square feet in, of developed warehouse space available. So that fact didn't seem to match up against the claims being made. Uh, we also think that legislation shouldn't, should be concerned about public policy goals, not politics. Uh, the legislation, part of it would have allowed the mayor of St. Louis City or a county executive to restrict who could receive hundreds of millions of dollars in subsidies. And that didn't seem to have much to do with any practical reason. It just seemed to serve some kind of political purpose. So what, re what we really strove to do was to say, OK, here's what the legislation says. Here are the questions that we have. Can you answer them? Where's, where are the, where's the substantive evidence that we need to do this? Is there a commitment from China? Why, why do we need a, a developed where, more developed warehouse space if we have so much already? And I, I think that we were very successful in elevating the conversation above just the promises to, tar to start talking about the substance. And I hope that we do more of that work in the future. I think that we really have the capability to look at claims and look at facts and try to elevate the discussion that much more. So thank you. And I just, before we start, you know, I would just echo that too. Um, it is really important that you play the active role you play, played in this piece on, on all things going forward. There's just not enough of this work being done. Um, if you, you know, um, when you try to follow state and local politics from home, 
it's almost impossible. You know, you, there's a couple of websites you can go to that can consolidate every paper in the entire state, but there's so little um, information that comes back to the, to the voters. Uh, there's so little detailed analysis that gets back to the voters. Uh, it, and, and it's not, in, in this example, it's a very complex um, part of that bill, but there's so many other complex parts of other bills and other programs that uh, don't serve the people of Missouri well, but don't ever get flushed out in the in kind of traditional media um, for whatever reason. So I think that um, the role that you all played, particularly kind of since uh, regular session ended, is evidence of what you can do and the desire of the community to kind of reach out and find your research and find your information and, look and, and listen to what you have to say. I mean, it's overwhelming. There's a huge desire to, uh, to get information. So I can't emphasize enough what you've done as an organization up till now, but then what your potential is in terms of continuing this research and educating people. Thank you, Senator. Um, and I, and I hope that we're helping legislators because there's a sense that I have that there's a gap sometimes for research there where you do have some resources but maybe not enough resources in certain areas. Well, what happens is, is people, like in this, in this overall bill, there, there are parts of it that are very important. Like each, each senator or each faction has some aspect of it that's the most important part to them. And they all know everything about that. And it's harder for them to have the same kind of knowledge about you know the entire what's in the entire legislation. Um, there are some seats up, up front, so those of you who are standing, if you want to come up front, I I want to open it up to questions, um, and we would like to have a dialogue. So anyone have a question? Yes, ma'am. Of course, including the one of them concerning about uh, what's for the China deal. But I would like to know if the circle breaker, is that attached to it? Local control of the police and that health care, you know, for instance, that if my child is sick, I can help them and I will get monies for helping them. Uh, all those things are in there, attached to that China hood. Well, um, I know. Uh, Two, or two questions I can answer. So the circuit breaker is not part of the legislation that was passed by the Senate Bill 8. So that was amended out of the bill. So, uh, so the circuit breaker um, that uh, renders tax subsidy remains uh, in existence. So it would not be part of the re reform. Um, and local control, unfortunately, I, and unfortunately in my mind, the um, decision was made by our leadership to tie all these bills together. So actually, um, the, the Messiah legislation is tied to the economic development re legislation, and then actually local control is stuck in a committee in Ways and Means, um, and it never got out of that committee. So I think effectively local control for this session is in all likelihood it, it, it's not going to happen. <coughs> Any other questions? Now we want to have a dialogue. This is a time to judge Sean. Could you summarize the basic difference between the Senate's position and the House's position and how they, they look at ta the tax credit. Sure. Um, and I think it help, it's helpful to talk about the differences in May and differences now. Okay, so uh, from the very beginning, the Senate position was to, um, you know, the, the, the tax credit liability in our state is somewhere between 500 and 600 million dollars. This is the number of tax credits that are being redeemed every year that your work had in the last four or five years. And we know on a go-forward basis, we're going to get above 600 million pretty soon. Uh, and that's inside of a $7.2 billion discretionary budget. Now, clearly, you know, the state does get some um, revenue benefit from tax credits, but not $600 million worth. So the, um, the Senate, from the very beginning, uh, Senator Perguson filed a bill that was strict to reform, and, and it, it uh, dramatically uh, reduced our li liability to all the programs. Uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of $125 million a year would be saved in the pre-existing tax credit programs. And in addition, the most important in addition, it would ask that sunsets, four-year sunsets, be placed on the two biggest tax credit programs, low-income housing and historics, which uh, I really hope the organization takes up the same kind of diligence specific to low-income housing. I'll get back to why that's important. So the Senate, the House never wanted to put a sunset on those programs. And actually, those proponents of low-income housing are adamant that their program not be sunsetted. And for those of you who don't understand, Sunset means is that the program will end unless it is extended. And when you look at the Missouri Senate, it only takes really three senators can stop anything from happening. 
And so the, the people that are advocates for those programs, they look at that would be the end of their program. And, uh, and that was our position from the very beginning. And, and then a lot of other reforms, um, you know, there's 61 programs and each program had its own set of things that were, you know, we wanted to reform. And we're trying to pile up this cost savings. And that was the idea. And if you go talk to someone like Senator Ferguson, he'll tell you he's been trying to do this for four or five years and he can never get his bill you know, out of committee, on the floor. They've never even gotten close. And so, the, and I mentioned before, you know, all the powerful people that really wanted to see the China Hub legislation go forward, um, that was going to be the leverage. So the leverage for the reformists. Because the Airtropolis, the China Hub legislation, if it were standalone legislation, would have never gotten a vote. It would never, there was, in this economic environment we're in, it would have never gone forward. It was only when you can look at the net positive to the state could that go forward. So um, the Senate, uh, the Senate. That, so that was the differences at, uh, at the end of session. Um, at the very last day, the House said they would go to a 10-year sunset, but that was not a no. That's not a sunset. I mean, that's years and years and years from now. That was the difference. Now we fast forward to special session, and the com actually, in, uh, the compromise was worse than what we passed in, in, in April. So that's how bad the compromise was. The, uh, the compromise is where uh, Audrey alluded to. I mean, all these creations of all these different boards and the compromise, and again, you never saw this because it was never published, but it, it uh, actually, you were talking about the, well, the air tropical legislation changed. Here's the thing, the timeline for that was March 1st was introduced. It was a form, it, it changed three or four times dramatically during regular session. But what was comp, the compromise solution, um, this, the House agreed to go to a seven-year sunset, but then they threw in all kinds of things that we were never going to agree to. Um, Okay, so where we are today is the house, the house does not, the low-income housing people do not want sunsets. And so um, that's where we are. The house uh, is not willing to put a sunset on low-income housing. Uh, you know, we, as you know, uh, we took the entire warehouse subsidy out of the program. Um, and one of the, and, and we essentially suggested that there are pre-existing programs that um, anyone in the state that uh, goes forward on uh, economic development program could actually go and try to receive some subsidies, but not until after the jobs are created. And um, the house is, the, I mean, the, the house just, just doesn't want to put a sunset on low-income housing. And, and I think what you're going to see happen is they're going to pass a bill without it, and they'll know that we won't take it up. Now, um, along the way, it's interesting, the governor, we passed our bill, the governor said, oh, that sounds great. Um, then he went out and negotiated a deal with the, the house and the Senate, uh, the house and the governor's office said, oh, we've got a deal, which they hadn't talked to us. And I mean, it's amazing to watch the governor on this. He, he was nowhere to be seen the entire regular session. He came in the last 48 hours of regular session, and he come, you know, he's coming in the last 48 hours of this session. And you know, all along, it's he who, it's he who called us into session. And um, it, for him to, to think that we, he'll say, oh, well, you said you had a deal. Well, the governor knows where we were. And everybody in the building knows what was going on. Oh, uh, yes. Uh, what would have happened with Eurotropolis, do you think, if the Show Me Institute had not raised questions about it? Um, I think we would still be stuck because where uh, I think what you did though is you is you made you uh, the things that you that people don't like about the Eurotropolis legislation. You you move that that needle, you know. So um, the whole idea that the Senate would get rid of the warehouse subsidies, I think that's a direct result of the work that you all did. Um, I think they had a lot to do with it. Uh, at the end of the day, though, I don't think this would have passed anyhow. I mean, I, I, I mean, I think what you did was the perfect thing, and you should continue to do things like it. But um, what was interesting, and I actually, when I spoke to the supporters of Aerotropolis, I told them, I said, you framed this entirely wrong. You know, this was only about Aerotropolis. And if you go down to the Senate, it was, it was never about Aerotropolis. That, that was part of big tax credit reform. Um, and so the, the reality is, is that, you know, we were going to take $3 away from a bunch of other programs and the, the legislation would give a dollar to Aerotropolis, essentially what, what was going to happen. And, uh, and when you take $3 away from any, you know, and you know how it is in government, when you take something away from them, they fight tooth and nail to keep it. Now, I think what you're going to see happen is when this doesn't pass, what our intention is, uh, is we're going to go back down there in January and we're going to go back to those pre-existing programs and say, okay, we know that you're, you agree to caps. We know that you, know, you don't like sunsets. Fine, tell us how much you're willing to cap your programs. And if we can take a dollar from those tax credit programs, our intention is, is we're going to give it back to the people. So it's going to take the form of 
either an income tax cut or a reduction in the corporate tax rate. It just depends how much we can negotiate away from the programs. But so to answer your question, um, you move, you definitely, uh, you made it very difficult for the air travel supporters. They constantly had to, uh, to mold the legislation and they had to weaken it in their minds. But at the end of the day, I think it's, it was all about reform and the reform, uh, people that were getting that money were not gonna let it go. Um, they looked at, I mean, they attacked as, as much as you were all, doing your work on, on uh, Airtropolis, they were behind the scenes attacking it uh, in very effective ways. Sir. Um, why does the House and the Senate behave so differently other than the obvious political oh. um, it's, uh, it's real simple. And the House, um, you, you, uh, if you're not in leadership, if you're not in the Speaker, the Floor Leader, or the Rules Chair, uh, you have no power in the House. There's no ability to filibuster in the House. These House members are allowed to speak for 15 minutes and they have to sit down. Um, it's, uh, it's a very strict uh, leadership structure. You do what you're told. You know, there's no better evidence of that is when our Speaker negotiated with three Democratic members, okay, because we were three shorts vote, uh, short of a veto override. He um, went to three Democratic members, gave them their own offices, their own staff, their own committee chairmanships, and said, here's what you get. But when we redo the congressional maps, you're voting with us, and they voted with him. So the same thing happens on the Republican side. So the power is all con uh, consolidated in those very two or three people. On the Senate side, we have the capacity to filibuster anything. We can hold up anything in the floor. I mean, you think about you know, how the country was founded. The House was meant to be the people's voice. It's every two years. It's meant to, um, to quickly respond to people's sentiment of things. And the Senate is the slower body. It's supposed to stop and you know, concentrate and slow things down. So the Senate can stop anything. I mean, one senator uh, can come pretty close to clogging, you know, to stopping. But you get two or three, and that's all it takes. Um, is two or three. Just like, you know, the reform that was trying to try to get pushed forward the last couple of years, it, it never even got a committee most of the time. Uh, and so that's the difference. The Senate really has a lot more, the senator, each individual senator has a lot more individual power. Politically, what's the difference? It, the way you describe it, um, it has sort of a crass nature to it. Well, I think, I think what happens is, is that, um, you know, we're kidding ourselves to think that there aren't that people can't influence, you know. But you all influenced. Uh, each of us individually can influence. You know, senators and legislators open up their email box, and and it is very effective to have somebody send you an email and be very specific about what their concerns are. When larger groups um, organize themselves and influence and exert their influence, they can they can they can uh, really dictate uh, the the process. They can get on the agenda, get things off the agenda. And I think, like I said, um, if you look at and I, you know, I appreciate when you guys thoroughly flush this out, but you look at how big the low-income housing tax credit program is. There are years where uh, that redemption was $175 million. You, look, you, you know here in St. Louis, you know, was it a billion one that they've gotten in historic tax credits over the years? And um, you, you can imagine all the people that benefit by that program, all varying aspects of people that benefit by those programs. You know, low-income housing to me is a real interesting one because it sounds nice and warm and fuzzy and you're taking care of people. But there's a lot of business interests that really benefit by that program. And there are a tremendous number, you know, so you're bringing in organized labor, you're bringing in business interest, uh, then, you, then you actually do build low-income housing for people that otherwise might not have it. So you have all of those interest groups that will come to you and say, hey, you're cutting my low-income housing, therefore you're cutting, I'm poor, or I'm handicapped, or my son's disabled. And so um, what, I think what happened was is that uh, the, the House leadership they had been dramatically influenced by, in particular, low-income housing advocates. And, and, you, and, um, and that, that, that was the line in the sand. The sunset thing was their line in the sand. And uh, in the Senate, um, what, you know, what happened as far as the business community in St. Louis County, I mean, you, you survey that whole community, and they're 100% for the China hub. And you're kidding yourself you don't think that they can exert pressure. Yes, sir. Why, like, why do we need le legislation for the China Hub? I mean, there was an airplane that landed, I think it was last Friday. There's an airplane that's going to be landing in a week or two. Like, we, we have the warehouse space. Uh -huh. What is the argument for the, the, the Airtropolis portion of the legislation if, in fact, we're already getting stuff from China here? Well, it's interesting. Um, well, and, and the and we also have the warehouse space. Yeah, right. Uh, um, the Well, in terms of if you look at this idea, and um, if you want to 
take the extreme glasses half full, like, well, how, what could this end up being? And the idea would be that it end up being um, um, a, a cargo hub that uh, is uh, vivacious and active. I mean, kind of like, you know, when you go to the Memphis airport and FedEx is there and there's planes in and out all day long and there's a big percentage of population works in and around the airport. And, and that was kind of like the, the vision of that. I mean, that's the glasses half full version of what that could, could ultimately become. Um, and a lot of the discourse was around, you know, getting to that, that, that wonderful vision. The reality is, in my mind, this is, again, never flushed out, but then I um, spoke to the proponents of it. You know, don't ever forget that, I mean, the, we're dealing with the Chinese, and, and, and Chinese, is, everything there is, is government-sponsored, very directly or indirectly, but it's always government-sponsored. And I think what, they, what the Chinese need, and they will get from someone, is they need to get an endorsement from that local state government. That local state government needs to say, we're with you. You know, we want you to come. Um, they want to feel like there's a partnership between they and the local community that they're going to put this facility at. Um, even though the, the, you know, the, the subsidies don't go directly to China, but they want the state to say, yes, you're coming, we're glad you're coming. That's, that's how they operate. So, so the purpose of the legislation was mostly diplomatic. Uh, and again, and that was something that was never, you know, that was never... Uh, put out into the public discourse, but in my mind, like in private uh, meetings, particularly with the corporate, the corporate uh, people that got involved in this, that do lots and lots of international negotiation, you know, I asked them straight, straight you know, straight out. I said, look, the China want the Chinese want to know that we love them. They want to know that we want them to come. That's the purpose of that, you know, and um, and that's a cultural thing. That's how they negotiate. It makes sense, you know, um, the uh, when when. Our corporate multinational companies go to China, and all of them do, and they all do business there. Every single one of them get they get a local subsidy, but that subsidy it may not be a meaningful subsidy, but it's China's way of saying we want you here. Here, here, our government's showing you love. You know, so that never got flushed out. It was always, um, you know, there's always like this economic um, why we need this, and you know why you know why the warehouse space we have had to be, would have to be retrofitted. And at the end, they you know they actually had a. a they agreed to a subsidy for retrofit, all that kind of stuff. But in my mind, that's not what it's about. I mean, um, I've never negotiated with Chinese. I used to deal with Japanese a lot. Very similar cultural. And actually, people that negotiate with both say the Chinese are, are worse at this. Um, you know, my mind with the Chinese is we actually would, if, even if this had all gone forward, we wouldn't even know if we won this competition uh, until we'd been in it for five or six years. That's, you know, they, they, the Chinese thinking, you know, we think in, you know, couple election cycles and in, in, in four years, and Chinese are thinking in decades and centuries and all that kind of stuff. So, uh, in my mind, that's what that legislation was meant to do more than anything. Which is why you've heard publicly from a lot of Chinese officials that they're going to go somewhere else. Can, can I ask some sure. questions in response to that? Um, I I understand what you're saying that we want to communicate to China somehow that we're excited. Uh, but the negotiations were going for years. Um, mm -hmm. And then that was introduced kind of at the last minute in the spring. Um, and I, I wonder, when we talk about, you know, we want to demonstrate to a country that we are so excited for them to be there, can that be used perhaps as an excuse to get subsidies for whoever is dictating the form that that excitement takes? Well, I, I would suggest, well, first of all, um, I think it was a mistake to introduce legislation on March 1st. Yeah. You know, it's like what I've been doing since the end of the May session is working with a group of senators, and we've got some a lot of really interesting ideas, a number of which I know you'll really like. That we'll, you know, we're going to have we're, we're drafting them now. We're going to file them in December. I mean, we're, we build coalitions to support. So uh, it's a mistake on anybody's part to introduce a brand new idea on March first. I think though, the people that have been working on um, China Hub for these three or four or five years, they knew eventually the time was going to come where state subsidies were going to have to be put forward. And maybe, maybe what the idea was is by waiting until March in the session that you, in this two and a half month window, could get it through. And if you let it air out for a whole lot longer than that, then maybe that wouldn't work. Um, but all along, I mean, you, know, you can bet that in all discussions with the Chinese over the years, if it wasn't said outright, it was implied that, yes, the state would welcome you to, uh, to, to Missouri. That the, that the government would welcome you. And evidence of that is every time that a delegation would go over, you'd see that it would be a county executive or the mayor or you know the, the governor. I don't know, he, was, he wasn't quite sure if he was going to go to Taiwan or China, all that kind of stuff. 
But the whole idea is, is you know, when you negotiate with Chinese, it's government to government mm -hmm. uh, with kind of business people in the room. So. Mm -hmm. I, I just find that, um, I, I, I mean, you know, sorry, I, I just find this an interesting wrinkle to it because I know when we were um, requesting studies and correspondence and notes mm -hmm. from the, some of the, some of the notes from the meetings with Chinese officials were, well, the Chinese official would say, we don't think this will be profitable. But if you're so excited about it, you're welcome to charter one of our planes and take the risk on yourself. I think mm -hmm. it's an interesting intersection of business and government. You know, I think as a, and you'll do this, I'm sure, as an ultimate follow-up, if they ultimately do go somewhere else, you know, you, you, wherever they go, they'll have, you'll have that state welcome them there. Um, it's just part, that's just the culture. That's just how, how it'll work. Mm -hmm. And so, that, and that's a challenge. I mean, I, I even think that, uh, you heard a lot from Airtropolis proponents that uh, the version of the bill that we pass now is where there's a subsidy for exportation of goods you know, back from here to China, and then the warehouse part is really a long process. It really doesn't, there's not a warehouse part anymore. Um, and we heard from the proponents of Airtropolis that that wouldn't, that wouldn't work. Like if, that, like when that option was thrown out during regular session, I said, well, that's not going to work because, you know, and the idea there is the Chinese would understand that that's not, a, that you're not saying, hey, we love you, come on in. Uh, Senator, two things on, excuse me, on this, this issue, because it seems uh, to revolve around a practical use of what is now an expanded airport, but which has a reduced use. Mm -hmm. um, and the corresponding um, recognition that just several miles from here, in Illinois, there is a companion effort to mm -hmm. bring the Chinese to this area. And it's, it seems to me that we really do need long-term thinking. And we need long-term thinking in terms of the viability of an airport and a companion effort just miles from here in a region that we really do consider and call St. Louis. Mm -hmm. And how do citizens like myself advance to you and the other members of the Missouri General Assembly, let's sit down and think, let's think policy that really is long-term and beneficial, not just for a small enclave in St. Louis, but for the region as a whole. Because I believe as we build bridges across the river, that's a clear indication of how our commerce mm -hmm. works in, in this part of the country. And it also concerns me that we're really more stymied locally. I, you know, Chinese, wonderful. But as a traveler out of St. Louis now, and particularly for business travel, the fact that I have to make connections in either Chicago or Dallas or Denver and waste hours of my time in order to uh, accommodate that, it would seem to me that our better efforts, policy efforts, would be spent in thinking about what we're doing locally to ourselves as a business community and you know, fine with the Chinese, but I think there are more realistic things we could do with our neighboring state and, and with the airline community to, to build a vibrancy in, in that way. And, and uh, that's really where our, and again, I recognize it's long-term thinking, mm -hmm. Senator. It's not something that's gonna happen overnight. Well, I appreciate it, and I'll take, there's a couple of things in, in those comments. First and foremost is, um, a, a real issue we have at the state, local, and, and, and the federal level is this idea of long-term thinking. Uh, and that it, it, uh, one of the things that has to start to happen, um, and hopefully happen soon, uh, is that elected officials can get in front of groups of people and say, um, I didn't do anything, I got out of the way, or I, you know, we, we rolled back what government does, and therefore I'm asking you to re-elect me. Uh, and until that actually happens, Will you see elected officials have the political courage to not do something? I mean, it's extra. I mean, you know, I, I, from the very beginning, whenever anyone would ask about Aristopolis, I would, I would correct them and say, oh, you mean the tax reform bill, you know? And so, for some, it's a tax reform bill. For some, it's the Aristopolis bill. For some conservative Republican senators, a lot of the rural Republican senators, they think it's a jobs bill. Um, okay, which is, which is ironic because if, you, if tax credits stimulate economic activity and you're going to reduce the total tax credits by $100 million, it's probably an anti-jobs bill without logic, right? But, um, but the problem is, is that when, you, when I asked you for your, to, to put me back into office and you asked, well, what have you done? 
until someone says, well, I, got, I, I, I did this. I, pu I reduced this program, this program, this program. I got th out of the way. We got, uh, we, like one, um, and, and, there, and I'm not, so I didn't do anything specifically other than get government out of things. Please reelect me. And until the time comes that that person gets reelected, people will be very reluctant. The old formula is, I did this. I passed a jobs bill. I did the China hub. Those, those are what show up on a campaign brochures. Um, what, you, what was also in your comments was, we are, there's a big problem. This part of the state is in, is in deep trouble. You know, um, I didn't understand the rest of the state's perspective of St. Louis, but I think the rest of the state was about, about 10 years from now. Like right, right now, the rest of the state looks at uh, si the city of St. Louis. They, they think, oh my God, I wish there was some way we could fix the city of St. Louis, but you know what? It ain't gonna happen. You know, the population's declining and the fiscal problems are what they are. And so I think that most of the um, downstate, uh, outstate uh, elected officials, they wish that St. Louis would get better, but they've kind of given up on St. Louis. I think they're 10 years away from the same thing in St. Louis County. I think if St. Louis County doesn't get its fiscal house in order, if, it, if population continues to decrease, um, you know, the state is a center-right state, but our region is a very left-of-center region. And if they're not careful, they're going to lose... Um, they're going to lose whatever leverage they have now. They're going to lose it over time. The, the thing that also didn't come out in this whole debate, though, you talk about the airport. You know, our airport is um, one of the most leveraged airports in the country. So the reason that we don't have access to direct flights that we might otherwise have is we have the li highest landing fees of any airport in this part of the country. I mean, us, uh, it, it, I don't know the metric, but it's uh, our landing fees are four times what they are in Kansas City. So the idea that we'd attract direct flights and um, you know international flights or more of that, um, we're so far away from that. I, I actually think that people that understand the economics of the airport, the China hub, again, they didn't, and they didn't flush this out, it might be, they're, they're looking for some way to save the airport. And so the idea that this might help save the airport, that had an underlying appeal. The reality is I think the airport's probably a year or two away from having to restructure all its debts. Um, I don't think it's tenable. That, you know, if we go into another recession, and you know, you saw the news yesterday with American Airlines that they're uh, they're tenuous at best, and they're you know they're citing uh, diminishment of you know international travel. One more recession like that in the airport would probably be have a hard time servicing its debt. Well, I'm going to start my question by telling you I'm totally not in favor of government picking winners and losers, and I think they do that through the tax credit system. Um, I want to know, I've done some reading on one of the things that they were talking about doing was reforming the way they're going to award these tax credits. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't hear you talking about, is that making any progress at all? I mean, for instance, I heard that, or I read somewhere, it maybe it was even in Audrey's stuff, that there were something like 100 million in tax credits already awarded in that area, 190 million waiting to be awarded in that area, and then they were talking about doing this, this other 300 million right. To the warehouse. I mean, when we're just giving tax credit after tax credit after tax credit the, the, the a, we can't afford, the system and B, that, they don't need. If uh, a business is profitable, right. they shouldn't get all I couldn't money. agree with you more. Okay, yeah. the system that we have today, it's, it, it's extraordinarily complex. Uh, it's been pieced together over the last 15 years, one effort at a time. Um, it, it, if, you, if you and I were starting a state from scratch today, there's no way in hell we'd have any of these uh, tax credit <laughs> programs in existence. Um, and the really unfortunate reality of these programs is, is that once they receive, essentially receive an allocation of money or they're authorized a certain amount of money, they can award it kind of at will whenever they want to. Um, you know, in this last little period, like in the last fiscal year, the governor uh, chose to under allocate to low income housing. I think they only allocated about $75 million in the previous fiscal year, but then he announced the plan now is to do $125 million. I mean, this, the amount of discretion that we give to Department of Economic Development, to these different commissions, um, it's extraordinary. You know, all this stuff, too, is, and this is important to understand, is it's, it's, it's not part of the budget process. It's not subject to appropriations. Like, they have this authority. I mean, there's no cap on historics. The, 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 the decision-making group that decides what is a good project to do, they could award a trillion dollars if they want. I mean, there's no, I mean, they couldn't do that fiscally. But there's no cap. There's just and so whoever created these things, I think it's consistent with what has gone, what went on at state government and the federal government. If you think about it, um, from the early '80s to late '90s, we had unprecedented economic prosperity. 
uh, in very, it took varying forms. It took, you know, a stock market going from 1,000 to 14,000. It took real estate prices going from, you know, low prices to high prices. It took unemployment. Essentially, we had no unemployment because we were, you know, right around four or five percent. And what happened was, is that all of us, people in the private sector, we, we were just busy doing our thing. And we, you know, we let somebody else take care of government, right? I mean, how many times do you hear in the 80s and 90s, all oh, those poor teachers, they have to go sacrifice, they don't make that much money. We're in the private sector, we're doing great, you know? Or that poor government bureaucrat, oh, what a horrible job. And so what happened, why we weren't paying attention, is that they went in and they negotiated all kinds of things. Um, so we had government employees negotiate things, we had, um, you know, public sector unions negotiate things, we had business people negotiate tax credit programs when we weren't looking, you know? And uh, when you look at, it's crazy, because you look at everybody's projections for the future, and I can't imagine, I mean, even now they're rosy, right? So when we do budgeting, we look at things, and we say, how big is the government gonna be? Can you imagine what was going on in the, especially in the last half of the 90s? You'd forecast six or 7% growth, you'd have 16% growth in state revenues. Um, and then one, one important point, not, not to forget, I almost don't remember it myself, you know, this state was run by Democrats until 2001, 2002, there was, very large Democratic majorities in the General Assembly. This, all of the things that I'm talking about, a big percentage of these programs all started and were flushed out during that period of time. The Republicans took over 10 years ago. They've had the governor's office for one term for four years. So I think there's been two times, I think, in the last 120 years where there was a, a Republican majority and the Republican held the executive branch. And, uh, and this is not going to change. These programs, like what, what drew us to this debate and what got 32 senators to vote in favor of this legislation was the reform that the recognize, recognizing the fact that these programs are out of control and we were willing to offer up and you know agree to a new program that if you look at how the new program was structured relative to the old programs they had a, had a lot more protections than the old programs I'm not saying that they were perfect as they were written but the, the, there was an effort made not to make the same mistakes I mean there were sunsets there were caps all kinds of stuff like that um, but no, the, the, these, and this is why if nothing happens, we're going to go back down there and we're going to say, okay, we've got these 61 programs that are out of control, let's go take, and I think, that, I think the only way we can take that money away from someone is we have to give it back to the voters. I think that if we give it to some other thing that's a government thing, then I think that's not good enough. Um, but I, I, I'd be hard pressed to see if we say, look, we're going to take money from these these programs and we're going to give, we're going to, you know, we're going to eliminate, like my idea is to eliminate tax brackets. You know, we have, we tax the first thousand, next thousand. I'm going to, I'm going to eliminate tax brackets and uh, as a way of cutting taxes. Beavis. Two quick questions. One is the uh, governor has the authority to call the legislature into session in an extraordinary occasion. Right. What was extraordinary about this other than Beavis shocked? Did anybody think we ought to challenge the governor's right to call you into session? I mean, I would have understood it for maybe Joplin or something. Right. That would be extraordinary. Here's my second question. What about the idea of a constitutional amendment to say lower taxes, no tax credits? Would that make any sense to the public go for it? Well, to your first point, um, I agree with you. I mean, special session, this is nothing special about this session. And someone made the mention that the last, if, we, if this bill passed, this would be the third time that the economic development bill passed in special session. So I think what's happened now is that um, is that we've made, we've extended the deadline. So we've got that constitutionally, that second week in May, second Friday in May, we have to be done. Well, now everybody winking and nod, they know that we can come back at any time. And so when you're negotiating, you're trying to, get, you know, deadline's important. If a deadline can move, it's a problem. One of the pieces of legislation that we're going to coalesce around is we're actually going to go from an 18, and this takes a vote of the people because it's a change in the uh, Constitution, we're going to go from an 18-week session to a 12-week session. Yeah, and the whole idea there, and, and so the whole idea there is to uh, is that there's all kinds of wasted time. It's really to move the deadline up, you know, get more pro productivity out of the people that when they're there. I also think that that would open up an opportunity. I mean, I, I have I have some very full time jobs and a full time I'm a full time dad, and uh, if we go to a 12 week session, I think you might open up uh, this as something that more people can do, more competent people can do. Uh, and then, and then, what that also would end up happening is then, if there is a special session, a special session would actually have to be called before the start of the next fiscal year, which is really a crazy thing. We started our fiscal year on August first, and we could actually change. You know, we passed a budget, we, we actually changed laws. So, um, no, I think this is ridiculous, and I think that we, sh that we, and the ironic thing is, we were called a special session, and Joplin wasn't even mentioned. We're not even there to deal with Joplin, uh, which would have been the obvious one. I think that um, the. Uh, as much as 
you, we all would like, like if we, I always have this conversation, so if we were starting a state from scratch, what would it look like? And we all know it would look very different than it exists today. And then in our gut, we said, let's get there. You know, let's go from where we are to where that is. And I think that the political realities are you just have to, you have to move in that direction. You have to move, and I think, like for example, your idea of you know, lowering taxes, or I know that this institute is a big proponent of eliminating the income tax. You know, I think that the, um, and, and we hear a lot about elected officials that say, well, if we don't do these economic development things, we don't do these tax credit things, then we'll just lose to all the other states. And, and you know, I think that, that was, those were the rules the last 20 or 30 years. But if we're planning long term, and we want to win 20 years from now, I think that the rules are going to change. And I think the first state that says, that stands up, the first governor stands up and says, hey, here's what we did this year. We worked really hard and we got, we, 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 we we're getting government to be more efficient and we're going to cut everybody's taxes by a quarter of a point. That's what we can do this year. And we're going to go back next year and we're going to figure out a way to cut your taxes again by a quarter of a point or the best we can do. And if it's a great year, maybe they come back and say, hey, we, we figured out a way we're going to you know, reduce corporate income tax. But if that's the theme, if this state says over and over again, we're going we're gonna to try to get more to government every year. We're going to get more government for the same dollar or we're going to ask you for less dollars. And you give that to a business person and they put that on their spreadsheet. If you look at a spreadsheet, you know, decision makers in business, if they say, okay, well, we're going to move to Tennessee, we're going to get, you know, actually, here's a great one. Uh, you, well, you guys know this one, the AMC move, right? Yeah. So I spend a lot of time in Kansas City now, so AMC moved a mile and a half for 49 million bucks. So what happened to the Kansas City region? Nothing. What happened to Kansas? Uh, what happened to our, we lost some t taxpayers, and, but Kansas paid $49 million for them. AMC puts it on a spreadsheet, they put in $49 million over 10 years. That's where they go. They put in the state tax rates. They keep them constant. You know, they say, Kansas state tax rate is this, this is what the t tax rate will be, where do we go? If you put in Missouri's tax rate, and you said, well, it's, it's, it's six and a quarter now, but you know, it was six and a half last year, it was seven, you know, whatever it is. If they, if we, if they plug into that sheet that, well, there's a chance Missouri's tax rate is going to go from six and a quarter to six to five and seven eighths to five. If they put on the spreadsheet, they won't need the economic development credits. Okay, so that, that's where I think the next, the winner of the next economic war amongst the states is the one that says, we are the cheapest place to do business and we will be cheaper on a go forward basis. Just a comment, I, I, I appreciate the fact that Chomi Institute is, is standing up because this is a powerful lobby here to challenge, uh, you know, civic progress and RCGA and, and the uh, Regional Business Council and, and question the dollars that they can justify in their studies that are highly suspect to begin with uh, is, I think, a real credit to this organization. And I hope you continue to. Uh, to work at that. Thank you. Moberly, first of all, what's oh, going to yeah. happen? Mm -hmm. And that's the first question. Right. And the second question which goes with it, how much money came from the state and how much money came from the feds and how much federal money is in the pipeline and should we take it? That's a lot On Moberly? Yes. Okay, well, that's easy then. The, well, first, uh, and, and, then, and now we're going to talk about, you know, uh, situation that um, is how what goes wrong and how bad it can go wrong and I also think it talks uh, now we talk a little bit politics in terms of what I see the next 14 13 months being all about so what happened in Moberly uh, Moberly was Mantec is a sugar sweetener company Chinese based company that what we now know uh, went around the country and shopped their idea and shopped their willingness to uh, re to locate a plant somewhere inside the United States and they were rejected by a number of states. And that idea came to our Department of Economic Development. And then our Department of Economic Development took that deal and shopped it amongst states. And they found Moberly. Moberly agreed to be the recipient. Now, what, what had to happen is there's a certain classification that Moberly has, um, and such that the investors in Mantech, if they invest half a million dollars into somewhere in the United States, that that community is designated as a certain uh, level of need that then the investors themselves will qualify for special visas. Um, and so, uh, which I, I think remains to be understood is if the Department of, Department of Economic Development knew that or not. But this idea, so this idea came to Department of Economic Development, it was then shopped, Moberly agreed to do it, and I think, and there was actually a pretty cool, there's a pretty cool story about 
a very small local newspaper in Moberly that kind of has since went out of business, but they were all over this thing. And, and I think the deal from start to finish was 72 days was how long it took for this deal to be introduced and to be agreed to. Um, the, uh, the state dollars, uh, the, the programs that this Mantec was going to try to qualify for were all kind of after the fact incentives. They actually had to create jobs to get a tax incentive. So there's no state money that has been allocated to them. Um, if they had created the jobs, they would have gotten the money. That's actually where, where the, uh, Air Tro the, the cargo part of Aerotropolis ended up and that's where they'd have to go to those programs where they actually have to you know, create jobs and then they qualify for credit uh, redemptions. The, the federal money is, is implicit, it's not direct. So what Moberly was able to do was they were able to, bi uh, to issue debt uh, in the Build America Bond Program. So for those of you who don't know, um, after the 2008 credit crisis, uh, one of the big concerns that state and local governments had was their inability to issue debt. And, um, and so what the federal government did is they stepped in and they said, hey, you know what, we'll, we'll basically backstop debt to a certain degree and we'll issue debt that uh, will be taxable as opposed to tax exempt. So they actually issued debt that um, institutional bond buyers could buy who, who weren't seeking a tax exempt bond. And uh, so that program, um, if you look at municipal bond issuance for uh, 09 and 10, it was a small fraction of what it had been historically. And so Moberly issued the debt under those terms. Um, and I think it's going to be an interesting thing to watch now because essentially uh, Mantech doesn't exist. They're, uh, they're going to be in bankruptcy um, or they're trying to restructure. They missed uh, a bond payment, but they had the first bond payment in escrow. Uh, and Moberly is on the hook for thir either 37 or 39 million. I think 39 because 2 million was in escrow. Uh, 37, excuse me. And what's interesting is you look at, I think the chief underwriters of the debt were Morgan Keegan. Um, this is regional investment bank. And they've, uh, they've hired a bunch of lobbyists, and I think the, the, we're all getting ready to see who's liable and where the state might, may or may not fall. And I think they've got, I think that Morgan Keegan has got two chances, and it's slim to none uh, at the state level. Now, this is, and it, what's interesting is that, you know, this is going on when Solinda's going on, when uh, also um, uh, Wi Fi down in Kirksville is, is a smaller investment, it's a million dollar investment. Uh, there are a number of other investments that um, were made through federal subsidies. Um, in the last two or three years, that you know, it's interesting. When, you, when you, if you have a bad venture and you're, you're, you've got you're burning capital, you got a burn rate. If I have a bad idea and uh, and I'm burning capital, but you give me a certain amount of money, it takes about a year or two to burn through it. So I think we're going to see between now and next fall, we're going to see a lot of deals that got money in 09 and 10 that they're going to have burned through it by 11 and 12. And I think this is going to cascade. And I think to your point about picking winners and losers, I think we're going to see evidence of lots of losers having been picked um, <laughs> over the next 13 or 14 months. And I actually think that will be the theme. That's clearly going to be the theme at the federal level. And I think it's going to be a big part of Missouri's uh, election cycle. I, I, I fully expect there'll be three or four that you can easily point to. And they're very embarrassing. For This gets back to political people want to do something. Well, you know, in all these instances, they all show up and they, they wave it and cut the ribbon and, and they take their picture and they say, I did something. And yeah, you did something. You, you know, you misallocated capital. <laughs> and on that note, I'm going to be, one of the promises I have, and I hope Senator Landing can stay just a few oh, minutes. Oh, sure. Yeah. So you can come up afterwards and talk. Um, I want to thank you all for coming. We will, I, I'd like your feedback on whether we should do this again, because one of my promises, I'll get you out of here at 830 so you can get to your job. And thank you all again for coming. And we hope if we have another one of these that you'll come again. And thank you again. Thanks Senator for having me.